Good morning, everyone. It's a great joy to be with you today and to have this opportunity to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and to greet all of those who are watching us on television. Let them know that you are all in our thoughts and prayers as we celebrate this Eucharist of the Lord's birthday. Back in the early days of television, Steve Allen on the American game show, What's My Line, coined the phrase, is it bigger than a bread box? When trying to guess what some surprise object might be, it remains a popular question in the 20 questions parlor game where the first question is usually is it animal, vegetable, or mineral, and followed by the second bread pass question. At Christmas time, children often ask, what is a manger? Well, the manger is a feed box. It's a bread box. And the greatest Christmas gift of all is smaller than a bread box. In fact, it comes to us in a bread box. The gift is the Messiah. The Christ child. Many years ago, Reader's Digest, that publishes abridged versions of popular books, announced that they were going to publish an abridged version of the Bible. This elicited a rather droll review from the Washington Post that began, in the beginning was the word, but the word was too long, so Reader's Digest abridged it. I was reminded of that clever comment recently when I read a very profound statement by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI speaking about the mystery of Christmas where he says, God made his word short. He abbreviated it. The Holy Father goes on to say that the eternal word became small, small enough to fit into a manger. He became a child so that the world would be able to grasp the Word. In this way, God teaches us to love little ones. In this way, He teaches us to love the weak. In this way, He teaches us respect for children. The child of Bethlehem directs our gaze towards all the children who suffer and are abused in the world, the, po the born and the unborn towards the children who are forced to be soldiers in a violent world, towards children who have to beg, towards children who suffer deprivation and hunger as those children are refugees in Syria, towards children who are unloved. In all of these, it's the child of Bethlehem who's crying out to us. It is the God who's become small, who appeals to us. Let us pray that the brightness of God's love may enfold all of these children. Let us ask God to help us to do our part so that the dignity of children may be respected. May all these children experience the light of love which mankind needs so much more than the material necessities of life. The phrase, God made his word short, also implies that the word which God speaks to us in the sacred scriptures became long in the course of centuries. It became long and complex, not just for the simple and unlettered, but even more so for those who are versed in sacred scripture, for the experts who become entangled in the details and the particular problems, almost to the extent of losing an overall perspective. Jesus abbreviated the word. He showed us once more its deeper simplicity and unity. Everything taught by the law and the prophets, Jesus says, can be summed up in the command you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is everything. The whole faith is contained in this one act of love which embraces God and humanity. 
Yet now further questions arise. How are we to love God with our whole mind when our intellects can barely reach Him? How can we love Him with our heart and our soul when our heart can only glimpse Him from afar, when there are so many contradictions in the world that hide His face from us? But this is why God has abbreviated His Word. He's no longer distant. He's no longer unknown. He's no longer beyond the reach of our heart. He's become a little child for us, and in doing so has dispelled our doubts. He's become our neighbor, restoring in this way the image of man whom we often find so hard to love. For us, God has become a gift. He has given himself. He has entered into time for us. Christmas has become the feast of gifts, an imitation of God who has given himself to us. Let us allow our hearts, our souls, and our minds to be touched by this fact. Among the many gifts that we give and receive, let us not forget the one true gift, to give something of ourselves, to give each other something of our time, and to open our time to God. In this way, anxiety disappears, joy is born, and the feast is created. During the festive meals of these days, let us remember Jesus' words. When you give a dinner or a banquet, don't just invite those who invite you in return, but invite those whom no one invites and who are unable to invite you. This also means when you give gifts for Christmas, don't give only to those who can give you something back, but give to those who receive from no one and cannot give you anything in return. This is what God has done. He invites us to the wedding feast, something that we cannot reciprocate, but we can only receive with joy. Let us imitate Him. Let us love God. And starting from Him, let us love all mankind. The abbreviated word is made visible in the face of a little child. It's a message of love. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son as our Savior. The abbreviated word is also an invitation for us to be reborn, to begin again. The first Adam opened the door to sin and death. Christ, the new Adam, marks a new beginning by overcoming sin and death. When I was a child, an annual feature of Christmas was Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. The wonderful story is an invitation to conversion, to redemption, to a new beginning. Dickens presents the unforgettable figure of Ebenezer Scrooge, a greedy, miserly individual whose only concern is money. Scrooge hates Christmas, calling it humbug. He refuses his nephew Fred's Christmas dinner invitation. He turns away two men who seek a donation from him in order to provide food and heating for the poor. And on a cold and bleak Christmas Eve in London, Scrooge is visited by the ghost of Jacob Marley, who was cursed to wander the earth dragging a heavy network of chains forged during a lifetime of greed and selfishness. Marley tells Scrooge that he has one chance to avoid the same fate, Marley, Scrooge's former business partner, tells him that he will be visited by three spirits and that he must listen to them or he will be cursed to carry heavy chains. The first spirit takes Scrooge to Christmas scenes of his youth and there he's reminded of a time when he was kinder and more innocent. The second spirit, the ghost of Christmas present, shows Scrooge the marketplace where people are preparing for Christmas. And then he shows them Bob Cratchit's family feast and introduces him to the youngest son, Tiny Tim, 
who is joyful but seriously ill. The ghost also presents Scrooge with two hideous emaciated children called ignorance and want. The third spirit is the spirit of Christmas yet to come that shows him the funeral of a greedy man whose death evokes no emotion or sadness from anyone. And then Scrooge sees the man's neglected grave and the tombstone bears his own name. Sobbing, he pledges to the ghost that he will change his ways to overcome this outcome. Scrooge awakens on Christmas morning with joy and love in his heart. He spends a day with his nephew's family. He gives a beautiful turkey to the Cratchit family, and he takes care of Tawny Tim as if he were his own son. A changed man, Scrooge now treats everyone with kindness, generosity, and compassion. He embodies the spirit of Christmas. It's a Christmas conversion. Scrooge discovered that it is love and not money that brings happiness. Life must have a purpose. In Christ, we discover life's meaning. In some ways, Ebenezer Scrooge was not unlike the rich man in the parable of Lazarus and Dives. He was greedy and materialistic and completely blind to human suffering around him. In the parable at the end of his life, the rich man is consumed with the flames of torment, and he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers so that they will change their ways. Jesus says, that the rich man's brothers will not change their ways even if someone comes back from the dead to warn them. He says they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. At Christmas, the ghost of Jacob Marley does not come back to try and get us to change our ways. We have the gospel. We have the good news of God's unfailing love. God in his mercy has sent us Jesus Christ to give us another chance. Jesus is born in poverty and simplicity. He is unjustly tortured and condemned to death. But he rises to new life and offers us his friendship and invites us to a life that finds its meaning in making a gift of ourselves to God and to others. Christmas is an invitation to let go of the chains of selfishness, vanity, and vindictiveness, and hardness of heart. When confronted by the face of a little child who comes to us in a bread box, we see that God's love is always new, always fresh, never tires of forgiving us, never tires of loving us, of giving us another chance. Christmas says there can always be a new beginning, a new start. In 2006, a British-American film called The Children of Men opened on Christmas Day. It's one of these futuristic sci-fi stories about humanity in the year 2027, where no child has been born in the last 20 years, and as a result, civilization is becoming unraveled. Governments fall, people riot, fear and despair reign. To me, the most poignant scene is when the only child born in the planet in 20 years, hidden by his mother in a bombed-out building, during a battle raging outside, and the child begins to cry. Suddenly, the people hear the baby. The fighting stops. The sound of the baby brings hope and peace. This is what happened at Bethlehem. The poor child is born in the stable because there's no room in the inn. Then his family flees as refugees to Egypt to escape the death and the threats of a cruel tyrant. But the baby brings hope. God is with us. His love never fails. He invites us to live a life of love and service, to be part of a new humanity. Life has a purpose. We are not alone. Christmas is an invitation to begin again, to believe again, to love again, to hope again. Merry Christmas.